Hey, this is Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, and your personal trainer for love, welcoming you back to the Love You podcast, where you're going to learn everything you need to know about dating relationships, sex, and men from a man's point of view. And today I've got a very special guest. Um, this is a guy I met four or five summers ago uh, at a business conference in Chicago. Uh, he, he is very warm, very bright, very open, um, make, makes an excellent first impression because he pays very close attention to what you say. He, he listens and he processes. He's extremely articulate. Uh, at the time, uh, he was in uh, uh, a serious relationship. Uh, that relationship ended, and uh, not coincidentally, I think it's when his business ended up taking off uh, as the breakup doctor. So let me give you a more formal introduction to my friend, Kevin Kurgansky, known as the breakup doctor. Kevin is considered to be the top relationship coach in the world for people who are going through a breakup. He runs a successful coaching and publishing company online where he helps people embrace heartbreak as a path to awakening and harness love as a force for evolution. Um, Kevin is also a visionary leader behind the revolution of love, which is a movement to rebrand love from the desperate, needy, codependent love we've been conditioned to believe in and pave the way for a much more healthy, sustainable, interdependent, evolutionary love, which inspires partners to greater levels of growth and self-actualization, as well as higher levels of service and contribution, which in turn goes on to inspire the world. It's not a small task that my friend <laughs> Kevin is taking on today. I just give people dating advice, but he's inspiring the world. Uh, welcome, my friend Kevin Kurgansky. <laughs> That's an awesome intro. Hey, uh, hey, really, really happy to be here and um, looking forward to chatting. Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm the old guy, right, in this, in this field. I've been doing this for 14 years, and there are so many important voices out there, and I think women find it especially enticing when they could hear from, again, I, I, I actually hate the terminology, from an evolved man um, uh, about, you know, what, what good guys think uh, and how they process the same emotions uh, when it comes to dating relationships and specifically regarding breakups, which affects, you know, pretty much every relationship until the one that lasts <laughs> results in a breakup. So what is a breakup versus a relationship? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's terminology. It's your terminology. But how do we explain that to someone who's coming in cold? Yeah. Um, I mean, I still operate under the paradigm of breakups, but it's a, it's an interesting language shift that I think opens up a conversation around what could be another way of approaching it rather than like, you know, hating the person and breaking up. And uh, so basically it invites the conversation of how can we shift the relationship and how do we make this a collaborative thing instead of just like, how do we, cut it off and splice it and then create stories and never talk to each other again. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's one of the perspectives, um, around it. Um, but really it's merely about just bringing greater light and awareness to how we do something like transitioning the relationships that don't work out to find the one that does. Yeah. Because I, I, I hear the terminology and it, it, there's something about it that sounds appealing. Breakup sounds inherently harsh. Um, at the same time, I see, you know, I'm, I'm a big prop proponent of breaking up. That's usually the best solution to relationship problems is if this one doesn't work, go find another one that does. I find a lot of people stay in broken relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Breaking up is not a conversation. It becomes a, a, a months long, years long process of trying to fit the square peg in the round hole and talk about us and essentially they're, they're, they're trying to say something that's on life support. And so how do people know when it's time to just let go and call it a breakup because it's for the greater good of, of everybody instead of the incessant conversation about how do we fix what's broken? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah. A little, a little bit of a different one than the relation, the relationship isn't necessarily to, to fix what's broken. It's how do we part ways peacefully? Okay. Um, but, but yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, so that's one that honestly, I mean, I, I've struggled with that one for a large portion of my journey. I'm more from the camp of do everything you can possibly do to make it work um, and exhaust all your options and give it your best possible chance. 
And that's the only way that I found personally the resolve to, uh, to know that it's complete and I'm either unable to make it work or it's not meant to last beyond this point. And that's given me the feeling of satisfaction that I gave in my all and simultaneously leveraging it for lots of valuable lessons learned that then prepare me for the right person and also increase my pain tolerance so that any subsequent relationship is in contrast uh, much easier to deal with. So I don't necessarily recommend that approach for everyone, but I'm sure I subconsciously do because that's my meta frame that I operate from. But um, yeah, sometimes it is good to just cut your losses and call it quits. I think any major incompatibilities, like varying differences for how you either want your lifestyle to be or marriage or kids, or like if there's just misalignment, um, I think that's definitely a cause to evaluate. Um, you know, attraction, you know, there, there's different things to consider um, of when you call it quits. Okay. And you're, you're, you're deal breakers, so to speak. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I would disagree that one should do everything in one's power to um, make something work and you have a lot invested. There's a lot of love there. I don't think you, you know, you, you call things quits willy nilly. Um, I, but it's usually not what I see. I, I usually see people hanging on too long rather than cutting things off too quickly. So I, if anything, I tend to veer for, you know, uh, hey, if, if this takes so much work, if it requires so much communication and effort and therapy just to be, uh, I see, you know, my, my, my relationship and most of the people in my life, they're easy relationships. They're friends. There's, there's virtually no drama. Um, and drama is always to me a sign that something something isn't jiving right. Mm. Yeah, I love that perspective. I remember you shared that with me and when we met at that conference at Accelerate and it's been something I've been optimizing more for in terms of like the ease and the fun and just like a best friend in a way. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of a mature conclusion to come to and I think it takes some of those dramatic um, experiences to um, get us to see that, but yeah. Fair enough. So um, you see breakups as a sacred opportunity, right? You already alluded to, you know, what are, what are the big life lessons I'm learning here? What are, what are things that people should be looking for in their breakup? If we could find the, the silver lining to a painful end, what are some of those, those things that, that people should be gleaning? Mm, that's a good question. Um, different for each person, right? Uh, I... I think the main thing they should just be leaning into is that exact inquiry as a whole of like, what is there to be seen from this? Like, what is there for me to see, feel, and know? Um, because breakups have a way of just kind of like peeling the curtain back to illuminating things that you haven't seen before and something about, because it's a relationship ending or a breakup is death in a way. And just like death has a, has a way of putting context to life it also has a way of um putting context to your relationship to yourself to your life um and so i think it's really valuable to just absorb that window um and yeah i mean it could be a good chance to evaluate like what your deepest values are um i always find like doing a doing a deep dive into like what are my top five values or starting with like 10 and then really just like trying to cut out to get to like the core five and seeing whether whether I was compromising on one of these values or whether we were misaligned on one of these key values, that's always a good place to start. Um, you know, any kind of childhood wounds or triggers, whether childhood or not, just patterns. Because um, you can, most people can replace their, put another person in front of them and they'll find a way to reenact that same situation. Um, using another person as another impetus or trigger. So definitely looking at what core feelings does this person cause you to activate within yourself. Like if you're, if you're committed to feeling unworthy or unloved, like whether one man's a workaholic and doesn't have enough time or attention, or if one man has simply had a stressful week, not a workaholic, really caring, but I don't know 
got into an emotional argument with his mom and forgot about some little thing and then you feel unloved, it doesn't really matter because your core feeling that in your core wound that you're committed to feeling is unloved or unappreciated or undeserving or, or whatever. So it's like looking at those, uh, looking at those areas are pretty, pretty fruitful and many other things. I'm not going to sure. get into. <laughs> of, of course. Yeah. So, so you, you can see, right. Even, I mean, even broken relationships, as I said, most relationships do end uh, as a as a source of growth. The terminology is post traumatic growth, right? A- out of this pain comes something that's positive that can be carried forward into future relationships. I know for me, um, a series of girlfriends in my early thirties led me to realize, oh, I've got one core value. <laughs> I need a woman who accepts me as I am. Mm. That's it. Everything else is gravy. But the person who comes in and tries to change me, I got, I got no patience for it. I had way too many people say, Evan, I love you, but you need to do this, 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 and this. And I was like, just one person kind of likes me as I am. I will hold on for dear life. And that, that focus after years and years got me into one healthy relationship when I was 34 and then my marriage when I was 35, which was the woman was not that different than the previous relationship, it was re- really just building on mistakes that I made in the past. So I, I, that's my own personal window into the way you talk about post-traumatic growth is a series of breakups that teach you what you don't want so you don't make that mistake again. I love that. I mean, yeah, you kind of just, yeah, I love the way you brought light to that. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've recently discovered this term of post-traumatic growth maybe over the last, mm, one to three years or so. And um, yeah, it can be applied to anything, right? Whether it's relationships or breakups, but it's a fascinating phenomenon uh, phenomenon to explain just kind of like, why, why do these, you know, painful sort of tragic situations, um, like what, what's the gift in them basically. And um, it's cool that science or psychology or the attempt to bring science to something as subjective as the human experience has actually found some sort of way of um, labeling this heightened aspect of growth that we experience after things go sour. Um, and yeah, I think it can positively shape us to, you know, learn things, to study Evan's stuff, to study Kevin's stuff. I just realized your names are him. Um, or whoever you want to study, like uh, just embrace the opportunity, learn, grow, and find someone who accepts you apparently. Is the uh, lesson. For, for, uh, <laughs> everybody, everybody has their own thing that's important. Um, I've talked to a bunch of people, the mutual friends that we know, uh, some of the maverick next people, a um, uh, bunch of younger guys dating older women, and they were passionate relationships and they were very, very turbulent. I mean, you know, and they were really embracing the turbulence. This is the sign of passion. This is the sign of life. This is what it's all about. And I'm like, that's going to get really tiring one day, man. Like I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you, but, but, uh, at a certain point in time, you want to come home and realize, Oh, this is my safe space. Um, mm. the world is tough enough. And when, when I come home, I don't need the drama and I don't need to be challenged. It's not that I'm perfect. I just don't need, I don't need difficulty. I need warmth and an embrace. Uh, at least it's my two cents. Um, yeah, that's cool. There's actually, I, I love that you brought that up. Um, so there's, I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I've experienced a lot of the, because I'm always orienting towards growth. I experienced a lot of that rockiness and turbulence. Cause I thought that that's like noble to like grow and anyway. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's this interesting model that my friends, Brian Franklin and, and Jennifer Russell shared um, at one of the workshops I went to with them and co-hosted. Um, they shared this model of like, each relationship has like a a different context or main. So these are like kind of an approach to values. Um, Basically there's like three drivers um, and they come sometimes in different priorities for different people. So for instance, one is growth and evolution. One is like fun and play and joy. And then one is safety and comfort and like, uh, like not refuge, but you know, the, the thing that you just described that sure. warm, um, the relationships, the sanctuary. 
it, it, it feels like the uh, the business triangle, right? You can get something done fast. You can get something done well. You can get something done cheap. But, but you're only get, you're only going to get two of them. Yeah, yeah. That's what wonder, that sounds like to me. I won. I wonder if that's possible. I think you can have all three. I think it's just a. I think it's. I think the main model of that isn't figuring out what what one you're going to sacrifice in order to have the others. I think it's more just figuring out which one you're going to prioritize as your top driver. Got it. Um, so I was in a, I, I tend to be very growth driven and I've at different times either attracted someone who's more fun and play driven or more safety and refuge driven. Um, anyway, so it's, it's been, it's been really fascinating. So it sounds like uh, sanctuary and like refuge or something like that is really peace. I think peace was the word. Um, is really important to you. And I, yeah. And, I and, think it's really and, and fun because I'm in charge of my growth, right? So yeah. I'm always pushing forward. I don't need yeah. a partner to push me forward on that, but I do need someone who brings joy, light, fun, safety, companionship to my life. So that's, mm. that's why, that's why I've landed here is that's the, literally the one thing I don't need someone to contribute to my life. Cause like you, I'm, I'm always on that path of, of uh, optimizing and betterment. Mm. I like that. Yeah. I mean, you, you clearly found what, what works. Uh, no, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think it's a really interesting concept, but in relationships, it's what can I not get anywhere else? Right. Cause I know what the world has to offer. I know what my friends have to offer my guy friends, my work colleagues. What's the thing that I can get at home that I can't get anywhere else. And that's, mm. I, I think people try to chase some mirror image of what they are. Right. And they want to see it reflected back. Uh, and there's something appealing about that. I, I meet people in LA, they're filmmakers and they, they can only date other filmmakers because only other filmmakers could get them. And right. Self-help gurus who say, we're going to run retreats together in Bali as the, you know, the in, in, evolved couple. And like, you really just need someone who puts up with the fact that you go on retreats to Bali. You don't need to run a retreat with your partner. So yeah. I don't know if it's narcissism. I'm not skilled on the terminology, but there's something about the idea that you have to date the mirror image of you that I think people need to let go of. Yeah. I, I think it could be useful to, to unhook some of that for sure. And I just, to, I find myself playing devil's advocate, not because sure. that's more of how, not because I actually think opposite, but just to bring an opposing perspective. I like it. Um, I think, I think there's something sacred within that too. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be narcissism. It could just be, they just have a really deep value on growth and they want a partner that amplifies the thing they're already committed to in the world. Yep. Um, and so like I'm currently in a relationship where I feel that shared desire for growth and I feel like deeply accepted for who I am and this right. like refuge feeling that I get. Um, as long as it's not at, at the expense of those other two things. Because again, no one's arguing with growth. It's yeah. growth at the expense of your safety and your fun. Absolutely. Yeah. That, nothing at the expense of anything is generally fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now it's sort of time to shift focus on, well, why do people break up? You've got two people who are attracted to each other, two people who love each other. By all accounts, this should be smooth sailing. And yet, we, as we know, most relationships are not. Kevin, what's the number one problem in relationships? Why does something that seems so good turn so bad? Yeah, uh, happy to shed some perspectives on this. I think there's so many different ways it can go bad. And I think, you know, ultimately it's, uh, it's kind of related to the thing we were just talking about earlier is that ultimately we're two different people in a relationship, right? And there's no way we can kind of get out of that uh, fundamental paradox and predicament is that we are not each other and we are fundamentally two different humans trying to merge lives, merge selves, merge identity. And I'm, I mean, ideally not identity, but like operate as a unit. Um, and naturally we're going to have different preferences, different needs and different point of views and preferences and priorities. And so I think the number one problem that tears relationship apart, tears relationships apart to the point of breaking up or just plagues relationships 
or their the duration of their relationship if they don't know how to properly handle it is conflict and conflict i i want to bring a perspective to conflict that is different than just fighting although that's what conflict can manifest as externally like behaviorally um conflict is merely conflict of interest in a sense where one person is interested in one thing and one person is interested in the other thing how they go about doing that and the fighting and the arguing and blaming and shaming and criticism and judgment to whatever degree they engage in that is separate from the idea of conflict which is simply just a conflict of interest which is inevitable when you're dealing with two different people with two different um, perspectives and needs and so um I, I believe that the number one source of uh, conflict is actually due to an unmet need that we're trying to get met. And uh, we're not really adept at knowing how to navigate those conflicts or even know what that underlying need is to be able to communicate it effectively so that it can get met and so that the relationship can be this peaceful loving sanctuary where we can just make it work and it doesn't feel hard um because like like you said evan like it, it's the world can be hard enough as it is so to like to to have when your relationship starts to feel like it's so hard to even um get certain things to happen or for you to feel safe or comfortable or do the things you like things become strained and then people want to either leave or they built resentment they don't want to connect and then like all these little micro things layered on top of each other just dismantle it so um the concept of unmet needs i remember reading about probably an attached right you're only as needy as your unmet needs or maybe that was five love languages sorry i i conflate them because i read them at the same time but you're only as needy as your unmet needs mm -hmm. so how does one go about identifying what that unmet need is and getting it met if getting it met means having to change your partner? Because that's the hard part. It's not that your needs are necessary. They might be unreasonable. Sometimes people's needs are unreasonable. But <laughs> presuming your needs are reasonable and this is your partner and this is who he or she is, you say, okay, something's missing um, from our relationship. I've identified it. This person's not wrong for not naturally giving it to me, but I need to communicate it. How do you communicate that in such a way that doesn't seem like an attack saying there's something wrong with you? Yeah. Yeah, it's an awesome inquiry, I think. I think being in that inquiry as a starting point will is like 90% of the work. Um, happy to share some tactical things um, as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's important. I think the, the key is the, the space that this occurs in between, uh, what's the best way of putting this? Having a shared context with you and your partner that holds needs as sacred and holds, so like this idea that some needs, like I laughed and I was like, yeah, some needs are unreasonable. And then like, because they some are, and then I went into this. I was like, wait, wait, that doesn't that doesn't work. Like you can't think that way um, in order for this thing to work because sure. the underlying perspective is all needs are reasonable. All needs are yeah, all needs are sacred and valid, and these are like these precious human needs that we all have. So a good book um, that I learned this from is Nonviolent Communication by mm -hmm. Martian Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. um, so I resisted reading this book for a very very long time because mm -hmm. I don't identify as a violent communicator. I don't, I'm more, if anything, I'm more passive aggressive, which I've learned is equally violent to the reactive angry types. Um, but uh, yeah, I never, I never read this book um, despite working in the relationship coaching field for a relatively short or long time, depending on, on your perspective. But um, so yeah, about six years into into my journey out of the, the last eight or nine years that I've been doing it, I finally um, got familiar and acquainted with the book. And um, in it, he basically s brings reverence to this idea of needs. And so, um, and the only way I finally 
got to read the book is through going to this workshop called Compassion and Communication, which actually got me to go because I value compassion. Um, and so I think the, the compassion and perspective to take um, in communicating and just seeing all these needs as sacred creates a really safe environment for that person to then share. Like when, when, in, when in your sort of perspective of the world, you see whatever comes out of your partner as sacred and valid and worthy of attention, um, it makes it easier to both give and receive. Um, and it, then it doesn't become about changing the partner to meet that need. It's, you can just be like, hey, like, I notice I've been feeling you know, disconnected over the, or I've been noticing that I've like felt a desire for more connection um, this week. And I, in bringing this to you, I don't want to make you wrong. I don't want to make you feel like you're not doing something right. Um, it, it, it's just the need that I'm noticing arising and it may be arising because things have been busy at work or maybe I've just been so busy myself that when I come home, I'm not, really prioritizing connection with people even outside my life uh, or outside of you in my own life. But I'm just noticing that like, I feel this need for connection. Um, and that's really, it, it's not even like, it doesn't even become about the partner. All right. So that was great. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a, a, another wonderful book and it's easy reading. Uh, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye by Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I actually recommended it in my last podcast. I teach her stuff uh, and it's, it's of the same thing, right? This thing that you're doing inadvertently makes me feel a certain way. Together, let's come up with a solution for it. Right? So together, let's come up with a solution. It's not finger pointing, it's problem solving. So I'm with you on that. I'm gonna devil's advocate you. <laughs> um, awesome, I love it. On, on, on the specifics of every need is a valid need because like many things, it, it conceptually, you can't really argue with it. In practice, take anything that's too extreme, right? And somehow that becomes a non-valid need. Kevin, um, why do you have any guy friends? I want to spend all my time with you. Uh, Kevin, why are you friends with so many girls on Facebook? That makes me really uncomfortable. And when you compliment their appearance, it makes me feel like you're hitting on them, right? So we those can-, aren't, we can th Those aren't needs though. In her mind, there are needs. Well, that's where self-awareness, that's not a need. A need would be security and, I, and I, safety. I, I, I get it, but yeah. we're talking about something that's bubbling up in someone emotionally. Yeah. And remember, I've, I'm usually on the other side of this. I'm, I, yeah. I've, I've rarely been the, the needy one, but I've been with people who think that because they feel something, therefore it's the law of the land, right? And so... It's hard to talk, again, as a coach, to say, I validate where you're coming from, but what you're saying is that that's not really a need. Right? Yeah. Well, I have some un unfulfilled something inside of me. Um, I feel that it's disrespectful for my boyfriend to want to spend time with other people, to be friendly with other women, to, right? So, so, and again, we could flip it around, the guy who's yeah. like, who does the same thing. Absolutely. But ex extreme anything that people believe are needs how do you, and I, I haven't figured it out. I'm actually asking you, how cool. do you provide a moment of validation without saying that's kind of extreme. It's not actually a need. It's an unreasonable desire that will make anybody who's with you feel oppressed. I don't know how to communicate that because everybody thinks whatever they feel is valid. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love this inquiry. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I struggle, you, with, I struggle with it. That's why I'm bringing it up. This is for you to solve my problems because I want to be a compassionate <laughs> coach. And sometimes when it comes to me, I'm like, no, that's ridiculous. And that's never yeah. the right answer. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's the feeling is if you have such impossible needs, he needs to spend six nights a week with me. Well, he's got a life. He doesn't need to spend six nights a week with you. Well, my last boyfriend did, and that's my he, need. And people say this. People say all sorts of extreme stuff. There's the big bell curve of life. Yeah. And then there are the outliers who don't yeah. realize that they're outliers. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, nothing can really replace self-awareness, but hopefully these things enhance and, um, and train that a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that I, I do agree that um, anything turned up 
too loud can be an issue. I mean, even there's a saying of our, our weaknesses are usually our strengths turned up too loudly. Um, so with that in mind, yeah, I mean, I think people's requests, I think needs and requests are entirely different, like we've been discussing. And I think that, um, I, th I think the thing for people to do is to go inward and assess what, what am I feeling right? So feelings, part of the NVC framework, just to teach it a little bit more, because it's, you're bringing up feelings. So I gave a really incomplete definition of or An NVC practice. for everybody who's nonviolent Sorry. communication. Yeah, exactly. Nonviolent communication. So you, you ask yourself, you go through this framework. It's what's the story I'm telling myself about this. Oh, Bubba, he spends time with, his, or he commented on her. So what's the story I'm telling myself? Um, or he's got too many girlfriends, whatever. Um, what am I feeling? This will bring up a whole nother can of worms that I want to talk about with like feelings and emotions and differentiating what's a feeling, what's not a feeling. Um, when people say, so you ask yourself, what am I feeling? Oh, I'm feeling jealous or I'm feeling insecure so or anxious. So um, I'll get to this later, but jealous, jealousy is not an emotion or a feeling. Insecure is not an emotion or feeling. Anxious is not an emotion or feeling. It's undifferentiated emotions. Th these are things we feel when we haven't taken the time to boil down what emotion we're feeling. And if people actually boiled it down to what emotion they're feeling, they're feeling fear. They're afraid. They're afraid of losing their partner. And if they actually expressed what's happening for them vulnerably and said, like, then their partner can actually meet them and reassure them and actually create that safety that they're needing. So the need would be safety. Emotion is fear. And then the partner can actually provide reassurance. But when they're, when they're operating in storyland and judgment and assessment and diagnosing and he's a player or a narcissist and he needs all this attention from Facebook or he needs all these, like when they go into um, all these other extemporaneous stories, it's really hard to elicit compassion both from their partner as well as even their coach sometimes. So um, I th there, there's a great point when I like want to land that and there's a great quote by Marshall uh, Rosenberg on this where he says that every criticism, judgment, diagnosis, and expression of anger is the tragic expression of an unmet need. And so all of those behaviors that you said they may engage in is just a tragic expression of a lack of self-awareness, a lack of discernment, differentiation of what they're actually feeling because none of this stuff has actually been taught in school, we don't know anything about emotions. Our parents never, well, not our, but generally we don't learn this from anyone. And so uh, it makes sense that it would come out in a fit of blame, shame, judgment, make wrong, diagnosis, assessment of other. You rock that part, Kev. Well done, I was taking notes. Um, <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we're going to talk about conflict um, because it, it, conflict is inevitable. As Kevin said earlier, is if two different people have two different wants and needs and backgrounds, unless you're with your I, lobotomized identical twin, you're, you're going to have conflict. The question is, what do you make that conflict mean? Right? How much of a, a sway is it going to have over how well you get along? And are they, are they irreconcilable? differences or just little bumps in the road. So what's, what's the number one source of conflict between couples, Kevin? What, what, is, it, what is right beneath the surface that we can't see? Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's usually a lot of different things. And, and, and before I share the one I was going to share, there actually just another one popped into my head. Um, so I went through training with uh, uh, John Gottman's uh, level one at the Gottman Institute. So for those of you who aren't familiar with John Gottman, he's written a bunch of books and um, kind of one of the few people that take a scientific method to relationships. And what really, there was a lot of material in that. I only use a fraction of it. But one thing that always stood out to me is this idea of uh, basically perpetual, I think it was perpetual problems. And that anytime, anytime you bring two people together, unless they're your lamontopized twin, I've never heard that. Um, 
And even then, there would be a set of perpetual conflicts that begin to occur as a unique emergence of those two individuals. So the simple example he gives in his training is, you know, Susie's an extrovert, John's an introvert, John wants, or usually it's the other way in in the training, it was like, uh, Susie's the introvert, John's the extrovert, and he wants to go to those corporate functions at night. She wants to stay and read a book and the jacuzzi and relax. And there's this perpetual conflict or this perpetual problem that they're never going to resolve. She's never going to be changed into someone that wants to go to his social mixer things at work. She may do it, but it's never going to be her go-to ideal strategy or go to source of fun for for you know a friday night um unless she's feeling nourished and um anyway so there there's things like that right that that is that are going to be a source of conflict which is just the individual makeup of the individual and sort of where uh where they're at and where they're likely going to be and he he before i go into kind of like my answer i just wanted to share this because this is really fascinating stuff he he found that couples that actually try to resolve their conflicts and it, as in make them disappear ended up apart. They ended up breaking up because they couldn't resolve the conflict. Um, and versus the couples that learned how to manage the conflict, managing the different uh, interest or priorities uh, were the ones that actually were able to stay together because they were able to kind of work together in a healthy fashion. So um I guess in sharing that one, it's pretty, pretty illuminating, but two, it points to bringing light to what's happening, which is, I think the biggest source of conflict is that we have these invisible contracts that we have and that we place on our partners. And so what I mean by invisible contracts is like, we have these ways that we expect them to be our lobotomized twin, um, but they're not. And we're holding them to that standard and expecting that, whether reasonable or unreasonable, um, we're doing it and it's invisible and it's, it's not actually being communicated to them. They're not even getting a chance to sign up for that contract. Uh, It's hard enough to meet a contract that you actually sign up for. It's nearly fucking impossible to do it for one that you never even signed up for. And so I think that is probably the number one source. Of yeah, you all. call it an invisible contract. Um, you know, I, I always tell women, he hasn't read the, ru- the rule book that's in your head. Right? Exactly. It's of, you know, here, here's how the way things should be. Here's what he should do in every situation. Here's what I would do in every situation. I can't believe he's not doing what I would do. And so as a result, um, and again, I'm, I'm a coach for women. I, I remind women, men are sort of set up for failure because they, they don't know the, the rules. Uh, the rules are sometimes subject to change. Um, and it's, it's not that everything you're feeling is inherently wrong. It's that he's, he's so set up to fail that usually the best boyfriend always feels like a failure, right? He's doing the best he can, and it's, it's never good enough, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. he does. At least that was, that was my experience. Was, was, it was really, really hard to be, I thought I was a good boyfriend, and then I'd come back and find another half dozen things that I did wrong. <laughs> so um, it, 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 it becomes a bit cyclical where he's like, I don't even know what the point is anymore, right? I have a 50% chance of, you know, I do something thoughtful, I get a 50% chance of getting it wrong. It happened to me the other night. I wrote a, I, I ended up writing something about this. We were putting the kids into the bath. I usually handle bath, but my wife was doing it. So I was in the kitchen. And she left some bell peppers out. We usually cut up the bell peppers. So I cut up the bell peppers, put them in the kids' bowls, and tried to save my wife the trouble of doing it herself, only to find out that I cut the bell peppers on the wrong cutting mat. I was supposed to, not supposed to do it on the red one. I'm supposed to do it on the green one. Because if you do it on the red one, which is really for fruit, it leaves it kind of like a peppery scent, and you don't want that with the fruit. And I was like, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> like, I am trying. She wasn't angry. We laugh at it, but it's like, it is very, very hard to do things exactly as someone would want want them done. And so how do we get past this, these, these contracts that we have in our head about how the world is supposed to work uh, in light of the fact that no one's ever going to know that rule book? Yeah. Once again, lots of really fruitful inquiries here. <laughs> uh, uh, that's what I do. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
so yeah, I think that example is so telling of how insidious this is. And fortunately, it's able to be done in a context where it's friendly, it's light, it's cooperative. Um, whereas if this happens with many other things, you slip in resentment, you slip in character level, identity level criticism and judgment and shame and blame, and you always do this and past histories and catalogs of complaints. Um, so I think... I think treating each instance as an individual occurrence is a great start and a great lightening of the load, um, if at all possible. Um, Instead of you always do this, you are a... Yeah, yeah, just treating it on an individual case-by-case -case basis always just makes it so much lighter to, to deal with. Um, I think that that's something that's really easy. Um, yeah instead of like you're yeah so it's like oh and that when i thought that you were going to cut it i had assumed that you were going to cut it on the whatever the board that i would normally board and like maybe because that's not your normal duty you didn't know which one needs to go for what and so now that you've done it now you know and in the future and I'll, get it, I'll get it wrong the next time and, yeah. and she'll say but we already talked about this yeah um and that's well, and it, it's it's i think it's when you said it's managing it's not eradicating that conflict we we had an interesting discussion about you know doofus husbands and i'm like you know she, you know i took my kid to the park and i left his 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 sweatshirt there and she's like how could you leave his sweatshirt there and <laughs> she goes you know i have to remember a million more things every time i go out and i forget a lot less than you i said that's what you do all the time it's it would be like the person who's flying a plane for the first time versus the guy who's logged a million hours. Of course, you're better at this than I am, given that it's not my primary job. Yeah. And, um, and it, it remains frustrating to her that I'm not as good at parenting as she is, even though I only do it one tenth of the time because those 10 hours a day I'm at work. So um, I don't think it's something that ever ends. As you said, it's something that is just manage because the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We're not going to let these minor divisions or disagreements get in the way of the big picture. They're always going to be there. I, and what I don't remember from Gottman is 70% of arguments are recurring arguments. Exactly. That was the yeah, one thing was, I got from him is like, yeah, it's going to be that. So what are you going to do to accept the fact that you're never going to agree? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think that's awesome. I like that this is so humbling to know that like wow <laughs> uh and in the form of complete thought there but um yeah it's just this is such a humbling undertaking i think is what i'm really getting out of this to like love and be in relationship with another human being um valiantly trying their best to do to do everything and we're at the end of the day we're human so i think anything we can do to be gentler with each other kinder to each other more compassionate and just kind of making it an effort to offer something underhanded like if you're pitching try to pitch an underhanded um yeah i guess swing instead of a fastball and so um and with with men in particular that i mean i i so relate to the the dynamic you were talking about like not being able to get it right or like never being able to satisfy them thinking that we're ever like one day we will like well i i used to have that illusion at some point i've now learned that you know it's challenging but um yeah, I think it's a paradox to be managed. And I think for women listening to this, um, it's really, you're, you're getting two men giving you insight to what it's like to be on the receiving end on some of these things. And uh, men at their core uh, want to like provide and protect and win and like do a good job and be successful. So if home, begin, if home begins to feel or if relationship begins to feel like a persistent and perpetual container of failure it's a pretty unappealing one for our fundamental wiring and ego structure and identity and reptilian thing that we're like we're wired to like succeed and like provide and protect and when we feel like everything that we're attempting to provide is in some way inadequate and um falling short it becomes a very debilitating and demoralizing task and i think uh 
fuck. I mean, any, anything you guys can, no, can I, do I, to I, make I, it easier. I've got, I've got the, I've got the, I've already got the butt for you. You already know the butt of this. What if he's really not a good boyfriend, husband, partner, if he's selfish, if he's insensitive? Because that's, that's usually the pushback. I'll say some version of what you say, and you'll say, but you don't understand, Evan. He, you know, the reason I, I can't accept him is because he is blah, 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 blah. And then I say, dump him. And they're like, but I don't want to dump him. So we, we go in these circles where I'm like, if you can't accept that he's doing his best, go find another man. But if this is the guy that you're going to cast your lot with, you can't spend all your time telling him how much he's failing. Um, Absolutely. And, and so it's like, I, I turn something that's nuanced into something virtually black and white. Accept him, leave him. I don't know how you feel about that. That's me imposing on your territory, but. No, I like it. I, I like the simplicity of it. I mean, yeah, it does come down to, to acceptance and, um, yeah, I think it also comes down to communication, right? I mean, when you said, how do we, how do we manage this? I think accept him, uh, things are always growing, shifting, and evolving. So I like to accept him or leave him. I think acceptance is the first step. I don't think anyone should ever just merely accept their, their lot in life. So yeah. look, if, if people wanted to work better for them, then they need to equip themselves with the skills of effective communication. Um, effective communication has more to do with you getting the desired outcome you want and the change occurring rather than you effectively communicating your disgruntled feelings of blame, shame, judgment, and, um, and criticism of your partner. And so um, I think it's always useful to turn any disappointment or any frustration or unmet need. And this happens outside of relationships too. I notice this with my team. I notice this with business. I notice this with you know, all the time. So it's just like, what uncommuted expectation did I have? That's, that's the solution to unearthing these invisible contracts that we have is like, Oh, I expected you to do it this way. And now I'm feeling frustrated. That's different and easier for now. The man can just hear you instead of get this pointed at him around how he's this whole like selfish and inconsiderate thing. Um, so here, here, here's the other thing on, in, uh, invisible contracts is just because someone told something to us once. So like, I'm going to use the example with the cutting board, um, not to make a statement of your wife or your relationship in any way, but just to use that as a objective example. Um, if a man, so needs or preferences expressed in, in passing, they happen all the time. There's like a hundred that happen in a day something expressed in passing is not a formidable contract that all behavior change will automatically align and comply with this new precedented request for how things will be done. Our, if we happen to be extraordinary partners that are considerate, caring, accommodating, and have the free space, attention, and awareness to want to be better and accommodate our partner, we will make our best possible attempt to taking that randomly expressed preference and filing that away and remembering to do it different that time. However, a failure to adhere to this new policy in the passing is not in any way a contract that we're going to do it that way unless it's formed as an agreement of like, wow, like I notice. So I think the answer is making conscious agreements with your partner of like, knowing which things are little things, which things are big things and be like, cool, I, I get that, you know, maybe there's never going to be blah, blah, blah. And then actually sitting down or like, what are like the, the couple things that really, sure. anyway, so anytime we can take stuff out of the uncommunicated expectations, assumptions, needs, and requests and actually make clear requests and then clear agreements, um, then that's kind of a, a good solution. And then when things are broken, we can just revisit it towards that specific instance and then recommit to doing it another way and try to remove any kind of identity level evaluation, assessment and blame and judgment and projection um, as much as possible. That's a dense word salad, but I agree with everything that you said. Um, or you can just accept them or leave them. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate you're, the, you're the more eloquent. More eloquent than I am. This podcast has just gotten more and more interesting as we've gone deeper and deeper and deeper and just let Kevin do his thing. 
Um, I know I've learned a lot and I hope you have too. Uh, we're gonna bring it home by talking specifically about what to do if you're the person who struggled in relationships and it's, you've found it hard to have healthy relationships. They always end up toxic. If you choose the wrong men, you get abandoned, um, sort of definition of insanity and you don't know what to do to break the cycle. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Kevin, if you are one of these women who has never experienced the, what it's like to get unconditional love for a man, it almost sounds like fantasy land, how can they graduate from these pain for, painful patterns and know that there is a bright future ahead of them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, I like to, basically, it's my belief that we're wired for pain in relationships, all of us. Uh, there's a great book called Wired for Love. Um, takes a much more positive perspective. It's a book on attachment styles. Um, so basically how, the how um i wish god i wish i could just give simple answers um you're, you're not a, you're not a simple guy one day one day i could just be like commit to being the best version of yourself that's how you do it um okay so um i'll start simple why so don't you, we, why, why don't you explore that why don't you start with commit to being the best version of yourself and tell me what that entails cool um uh, I, I may or I may not. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I guess part of that commitment is, you know, committing to yourself and you, uh, your growth and your evolution and um, getting into the kind of space where you can, where you can hold a quality relationship. Um, and we all have a relationship blueprint. So I call it a subconscious relationship blueprint. Um, and I basically just use that as a collection of different things, including attachment styles, personality types, a bunch of, bunch of different things I'm not going to get into. But knowing your attachment style, I believe, is probably one of the most core fundamental things that you can start to do for a healthy relationship. And that's based on the idea that, uh, you know, we all form an attachment. Humans are the most dependent creatures on the planet. We can't walk or talk or do anything for ourselves we're inherently dependent on other people for our survival whereas birds just kind of hatch and can sometimes fly within you know a few few minutes so anyway we're our survival is quite literally dependent on another human being being able to form an attachment bond with us that causes them to provide for us and so our reptilian and mammalian brain are wired to bond to our partner and um kind of form form a steady attachment so i think in order to have a healthy relationship where your needs and preferences and desires can be communicated in this healthy interdependent um occurrence which is you know what what evan you mentioned about in the in, in the beginning when you introduced me and what we're sort of building towards the skill sets with communicating your your requests so they're not invisible contracts that you subject the other person to and then criticize the fabric of their identity for it when they inevitably don't do it. Um, anyway, so <laughs> the simple answer is to begin to take responsibility for being the best version of yourself and being able to regulate your own nervous system and function as an autonomous, independent being who can self-identify what is happening in yourself, communicate that open-handedly, underhandedly, and communicate clearly without judgment or blame or criticism and give the other person an opportunity to create this like collaborative relationship with you. What's a good example? Cause I, I, I get it conceptually cause this is yeah. also my world, yeah. but I, I was on, on the phone with a client yesterday and she's online dating and majority of her time is just spent venting. It's what's with these guys? Why would a guy, be really into me for three dates, and then we have this one miscommunication, and then he's completely out. And she's investing so much of her time and energy in what you've written here, blame, shame, making him wrong, right? Trying to solve the mystery of some stranger on the internet douchebag, right? And all of her energy is wasted on trying to either eliminate that from ever happening or make sense of what happened when it's like making sense of rain or traffic. It's just like, these are the things that happen in dating and everybody has, you know, forgive me for being Jewish, but everybody's got their Mishigas, right? So 
well, what's the point of worrying about everybody? This person's not my husband. This person's not my husband. This person's not my husband. It's sort of the way I see it. Um, but there's, there is an attachment to making sense of the universe, getting answers. Why are guys so rude? Why are guys so disrespectful? Someone should teach them a lesson. And it, it's, it's not productive. It's, it's magic wand wishful thinking. So how do you get people past that? Because again, this is another thing I'm struggling to do is to say, hey, you gotta, you gotta shake it off, <laughs> if you will, because there isn't an answer. You're not gonna police men or change a gender, um, no matter how right you are about their, the failures of their behavior. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, I see this concept of personal responsibility, owning your experience, making other people wrong, and that, that that voice runs their life to the point where it's, mm. it's, it's almost, it's almost hard to have a productive conversation about what we're going to do. Right. Cause we're so focused on what went wrong in the past. Yeah. That, <laughs> uh, so what was the question there? I, 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 guess, I, I guess, I guess I was looking for something tangible. Oh, uh, how, how, how does that look like in, well, in to, to help people right. re, re, reframe what might even be objectively bad behavior by the awesome. opposite sex. Like, so, I got, so I got this. Cool. Got right. it now. Um, so to bring that into a practical real world application. So um, you mentioned the word owning your experience or the phrase owning your experience. Uh, so this is something that I just recently learned. I'm not going to go into a long back when it's story about how I learned this, but in practicality. Um, so it's really easy to judge, blame, shame, and make other people wrong for the inner experience that we're having um, because we don't really, it's really that part of our judging mind. He saw this, he saw that. That's such an active voice. The mind that goes inward to discern our feelings and to understand what I call the language of emotions is not one that has been wired as often as the judgmental critical mind. So uh, shifting the focus onto owning our experience, and I'll give a specific example of how to do this with a specific thing you said that clients can that often say. Um, so I felt something as simple as I felt disrespected, whatever, right? Let's start with that. So through painful experiences in my own personal relationships, I discovered that uh, disrespect. I feel disrespected. Putting is not an emotion. Putting feeling in front of something, I feel like you're an asshole. It's not a feeling. I feel disrespected. Also not a feeling. When you say I feel disrespected to a man, you are somehow implying that his intent was to disrespect you. He was just being himself and acting. So to you, it may feel like you're being disrespected. Um, but the feeling there is usually hurt, scared, afraid, something, um, angry, like angers. And I feel really angry. Like that, that's a feeling feeling disrespected is an evaluation of somebody's intent. Yes. His state and, of mind. He didn't intend to disrespect you. You feel disrespected. And that's the first word that you conjure. Exactly. And so learning the language of emotions um, is the antidote. Um, there's a few simple emotions and then there's complex layers of feel, core feelings, interpersonal feelings, and uh, there's, there's social emotions, survival emotions. I've like studied this more than any one single human should ever study sure. um, through a lot of painful attachment wounds that I was trying to work through. So, um, so the simple 80 20 version on that uh is there there's a few emotions there's fear sadness anger and there's happiness so glad mad sad scared glad mad sad scared glad is happy anger sadness fear anytime you're feeling something if you boil it down to those four core emotions that's a good starting point and then there's more distinguished feelings that you can begin to differentiate that are interpersonal between you and other and then core, um, core feelings. So for example, someone 
abandoning you is an interpersonal feeling. You can only experience abandonment as it relates to an interpersonal context between you and another individual. You can't feel abandoned in a vacuum, just like you can't feel disrespected in a vacuum. You can't feel abused in a vacuum. So these are all social emotions or interpersonal feelings. Then there's core feelings. Uh, I just had this like flickering thought of like, holy shit, this is in like my high-end programs and kind of coaching, but yeah. I'll, 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 I'll throw <laughs> this one. Yeah. Is this the kind of thing that if we wanted to learn more, we can learn by signing up for your mailing list, getting your products and learning more about you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I need to start mailing about this stuff. I usually only do this in coaching. So, um, but yeah. So t- tell, tell our, our, our listeners who've, who've made it through our, our hour therapy <laughs> session together um, where they can find you and how they can engage with you. Yeah. Uh, honestly, if, if you want to do like the, the deep dive work that will get you to change, um, you can just reach out to me by email. Um, I have links and stuff I can, I can give to, but email is Kevin at the break Either me or my assistant will respond to that. Uh, in terms of like where you can follow me online and stuff, the break of sure. um, and, and then, beneath, beneath this, there is, there's a link to go directly to, uh, your, your stuff. So it says something like click this link to get your diagnosis from the breakup doctor or something like that. Um, sure. So, so people could find you in all sorts of ways, but I, I think you off, you offer something that is in this space, uh, in my world, something, uh, relatively unique. And that's why I was really excited to have you on the show today. I hope you, I hope you had fun too. Yeah, this is super fun. Yeah. I'm happy to, I spend so much of my time coaching that it's fun to be able to take these ideas and get them out to like a different audience and also jam with you. I know we've been meeting to, to connect more. So this is fun. Yeah. All right. Good job, Kev. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> my name is Evan Marquez. This is Kevin Kurgansky, The Breakup Doctor. On next week's episode, I'm discussing women who hate men and men who hate women and how similar they are and blind to that fact. It's going to be, <laughs> juicy. It's, it's going to be controversial. Uh, whether I wanted to or not, it's going to end up that way. So don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And I give more dating and relationship advice away than anybody. www evanmarkcats.com. Give me your name and email address and I will take care of you and help you find the love you deserve. Thank you for your time. I'll see you on the next Love You podcast.